Hi, my name's Ann Haber, and today I'm going to be demonstrating the anatomy associated with the digestive system. So we're gonna start with the oral cavity, and we've already talked a little bit about the oral cavity with the respiratory system because it is shared with the respiratory system. So uh, on this model, these are the lips, the teeth, the tongue, the muscles that move the tongue, and the oral cavity. Remember that the oral cavity, the roof of the oral cavity is formed by the maxilla fused with the palatine bone, and that's called the hard palate. And then posterior to that, we have soft tissue called the soft palate, and the very end of the soft palate is called the uvula. So the oral cavity, recall, empties out into the oropharynx. Remember, pharynx means throat, and there's three parts oropharynx, um, laryngeopharynx, and nasopharynx. I'm gonna go ahead and point out the um, tonsils while I'm here, uh, because this is a nice model to illustrate the tonsils. There are some tonsils which are part of the lymphatic system. There are some tonsils on the posterior aspect of the tongue, those are called lingual tonsils. And there are tonsils on either side of the hard palate, so lateral to the hard and soft palate actually. We have the palatine tonsils. And then we also have tonsils that are in the posterior aspect of the nasal cavity at the very beginning of the nasopharynx. Uh, we have the pharyngeal tonsils and they are sometimes called the adenoids. Now there's a space between the lips and the teeth and that space is called the vestibule. If you go behind the teeth or posterior to the teeth, you see that the tongue is anchored to the floor of the oral cavity by a piece of tissue called the frenulum. This is the lingual frenulum here, okay? And then we move back to the tongue and back towards the back of the oral cavity. So as far as the teeth goes, we're gonna talk about the adult teeth. Um, and the adult teeth, it does not matter if you're in the maxilla or the mandible. Here we are in the mandible. Um, and I always start medially and move laterally when I'm learning the teeth. So from medial to lateral, we will see two incisors, one canine or cuspid or eye tooth. It has all of those names two premolars and three molars. Um, the uh, third molar is uh, also often called the wisdom tooth and some of you have had your wisdom teeth removed. So two premolars and three molars in the adult jaw. We have some large salivary glands that uh, we can see associated with the oral cavity. Um, these are referred to as exocrine glands and they have ducts that actually bring the saliva into the oral cavity. So this one out here um, is called the parotid gland and this would be the parotid duct. This would be the submandibular gland. As you can see, it's under the mandible. Unfortunately, this gland is sometimes also referred to as the submaxillary gland, and it's really more submandibular than it is submaxillary. So submandibular is probably more descriptive term. Now, there is also um, uh, a um, sublingual gland that uh, we'll need to show you in a different view. Here's another example of the salivary glands that we pointed out earlier. Here's the parotid gland and its duct. Here is the submandibular gland and its duct. And then this is the sublingual gland, which we couldn't get very good view of on the previous model. So there's the sublingual gland and sublingual means under the tongue. So again, here's the oral cavity emptying out into the oropharynx and then becoming the laryngeopharynx. So anterior to the laryngeopharynx would be the larynx. There is your false vocal cord and your true vocal cord. And there's the 
epiglottis, which will come down and cover up the opening to the larynx as you swallow food, so that that food will be directed down the esophagus towards the stomach. And remember that we had an opening in the diaphragm. Here is the diaphragm. Here is the central tendon. We're going to have an opening in the central tendon that the esophagus will pass through. It is called the esophageal hiatus. And, a, and there's also this um, vena cava foramen over here in the central tendon of the diaphragm that the inferior vena cava will pass through. So we're on our way down the esophagus towards the stomach, and we're going to pass through the esophageal hiatus in the diaphragm to get there. So the esophagus is a smooth muscle lined organ and it propels the food by way of peristalsis towards the stomach. And let's remember as it passes through the diaphragm, which would be right here, it's going to go through the esophageal hiatus. Um, and it is going to empty out into the stomach. So uh, the external anatomy of the stomach, um, as you see, there's a big dome-shaped portion here, and there's kind of a bowl-shaped portion down here. Um, and it's going to curve around and ultimately uh, empty into this first section of the small intestine, which is called the duodenum. So this is referred to as the fundic region or the fundus of the stomach. And this is referred to as the pyloric region or the pylorus. This is the lesser curvature. And this is the greater curvature. And looking at this blood vessel right here, uh, and when we discuss the blood vessels associated with the abdominal cavity, this is the left gastric artery. So if we open up the stomach, and still situated anatomically correctly, um, we see the fundus and the pyloric region, and this middle portion here would be referred to as the body of the stomach. Now notice that the mucosa of the stomach has these pretty distinct ridges. So those ridges are called rugi in plural, ruga in singular, and their purpose is to allow for the stomach to stretch out as we put more and more food into it. One of my favorite structures allows me to put more food into my stomach, I'm all for it. Um, so uh, again, this is the pyloric region, the valve that separates the stomach from the duodenum of the small intestine is called the pyloric valve. So now we're gonna talk about the small intestine. So let's go ahead and take away the liver and let's take away the stomach. And posterior to the stomach, we'll see the pancreas and the spleen and the small part of the small intestine. Now, um, part of the small intestine is in the peritoneal cavity and part of it is what we call retroperitoneal or posterior to the peritoneal cavity. So the very first portion of the small intestine is retroperitoneal or behind the peritoneal cavity, and it shares that space with the pancreas, okay? So the very first 12 inches or so of the small intestine is called the duodenum. Uh, some people pronounce it duodenum. I don't really care um, how you pronounce it, um, as long as in my class you spell it correctly on the exam. Okay, so um, there's some, some busyness happening right here, which we're gonna come back to. I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate the um, entire small intestine, and then we're gonna come back up to here. So first we see about the first 12 inches, um, which is the duodenum. Um, and then we have several feet of the middle of the small intestine. When we measure small intestine, we are measuring the 
length of it, usually in cadavers. And in cadavers, the, there is no smooth muscle tone. So the intestines are a little bit more stretched out in a cadaver um, than they are in a living human person who has intact smooth muscle tone. So I'm just gonna say that the middle portion of the small intestine um, is several feet's worth of intestine, and it is called the jejunum. And the distal part of the small intestine is called the ileum. The ileum is going to empty into this um, pouch associated with the large intestine. It's called the cecum. So the ileum enters into the cecum at the ileocecal valve. And remember that the stomach emptied into the small intestine at the pyloric valve. Okay, now back up to here, there's a, a several ducts that are emptying into the duodenum <clears throat> and they're bringing uh, products that we need in order to perform digestion. So there's this duct coming from the pancreas called the major pancreatic duct um, and it's going to empty into the small intestine. And then there's this duct coming down from the gallbladder, and uh, we're going to take we're going to zoom in on all those ducts on another model later. But this one, this part coming down from the gallbladder, um, uh, which is carrying um, substances from the gallbladder and from the liver, is called the common bile duct. So um, the common bile duct, as you see, kind of merges with the major or the main pancreatic duct. And they merge together at an enlarged area. And an enlargement is referred to an ampulla. So this is called the ampulla of Vader. Or you could call it the hepatic, because part of this is coming from the liver, pancreatic ampulla. So this enlargement right here is the hepatopancreatic ampulla or the ampulla of Vader, okay? Um, they are going to, those ducts will come together and they're going to empty out into the small intestine uh, and the actual opening is called the major duodenal papilla. The major duodenal papilla is where those two ducts are gonna empty their contents out into the duodenum. And during digestion, there is a sphincter muscle which governs that opening. You can't see it, it's embedded in the wall of the duodenum here, but that is referred to as the sphincter of Odi. So here's another view of the pancreas and the duodenum. <clears throat> the spleen, these are the kidneys and the adrenal glands superior, kidney, adrenal gland superior. This is a portion of the liver. The liver, of course, would be much larger. And this is the gallbladder. <clears throat> so um, let's go ahead and take a posterior view real quick and let's refresh our memory on the blood vessels of the abdominal cavity. So, um, Let's remember that we had several large blood vessels coming off the aorta. If you imagine that my pointer is the aorta, we can see there's a major blood vessel coming off the aorta here and a major blood vessel coming off the aorta here. So this would be that celiac trunk and this would be the superior mesenteric artery and down here it would be side by side with the superior mesenteric vein. Let's remember that off the celiac trunk comes three different arteries. One is going to go off towards the spleen. So, of course, that would be the splenic artery. One is heading off towards the liver, and that would be the common hepatic artery. And one is heading up towards that lesser curvature of the stomach. Okay, And that's going to be the left gastric artery. 
Um, this is going to be the hepatic portal vein. Remember the hepatic portal vein is bringing venous blood from all of the GI organs, uh, and that venous blood is going to ultimately empty into the hepatic portal vein, which is going to empty into the liver, and we'll see another view of that on a different model as well. Um, so here is, again, the gallbladder and the liver. There is a duct coming out of the gallbladder called the cystic duct. And there are a couple of ducts coming out of the liver. So they're named right and left. So uh, this one is coming from the left lobe of the liver. So that would be called the left hepatic duct. This is coming from the right lobe. So it would be called the right hepatic duct. They come together to form the common hepatic duct. The common hepatic duct joins with the cystic duct to form the common bile duct. So the common bile duct then is going to come down here, go behind the pancreas, or uh, go um, uh, sort of in between the pancreatic tissues, and come out anteriorly over here, and we're still in the common bile duct over here. So let's remember that the common bile duct joined with the major or the main pancreatic duct at an enlarged area. The enlarged area was called the hepatopancreatic ampulla or the ampulla of Vader. And that the contents of those duct is, ducts are, is going to dump out into the duodenum by way of the opening called the major duodenal papilla. And that there is a sphincter muscle embedded in the wall of the duodenum here called the sphincter of Odi, which governs the opening between the hepatopancreatic ampulla and the small intestine. So that is, that is the sphincter of Odi, and it governs this opening um, uh, out into the small intestine. And the opening itself is called the major duodenal papilla. So we've discussed the small intestine, um, and the small intestine is divided into three portions. The proximal portion is the duodenum, and the middle portion is the jejunum and the distal portion is the ileum. And so the ileum is going to enter into, is going to uh, dump its contents into the large intestine, and it uh, enters into the large intestine by way of this valve right here, and this is called the ileocecal valve. And so guess where it's dumping into? It's dumping into the portion of the large intestine called the cecum. So this uh, pouch right here is called the cecum. Uh, the cecum uh, continues on into the ascending colon. The ascending colon makes a turn at what is called the right colic flexure. It is also called the hepatic flexure. We don't see the liver on this model, but it would be right here. So that's why this is called the hepatic flexure. Um, and then the large intestine is referred to as the transverse colon. And then it makes a turn over here, and that turn is referred to as the splenic flexure or the left colic flexure. The large intestine then descends on the left side of the peritoneal cavity, and this portion is called the descending colon. And then it curves around into this portion, and since it's roughly shaped like an S, that is called the sigmoid colon. And then it descends into the last eight inches of the large intestine, which is referred to as the rectum. So there are some other parts of the large intestine that we need to take a look at. First of all, um, we see here, uh, this is what we would in short call the appendix. Um, it is also 
referred to as the vermiform appendix, and vermiform means resembling a worm. Okay, and it usually it does come off the cecum, and it itself is a blind-ended pouch. Um, I am told that the appendix can come off of the large intestine in other places besides the cecum, but for the most part, I think we see it coming off of the cecum. So um, we also see that the large intestine has these bulges associated with it. Um, those bulges in plural are called the haustra, and they are what give the feces its form. This is a longitudinal um, piece of smooth muscle called the tania coli, and it, in addition to the smooth muscle contraction of the um, large intestine itself, uh, aids in moving the feces along the large intestine. We also need to take a look at the uh, muscles down here. Um, so the last eight inches of the rectum is, um, the last eight inches of the large intestine is called the rectum, and the last couple inches uh, are, is called the anal canal. And the anal canal has uh, muscles surrounding it, okay, um, and uh, the muscles that are more interior are made of smooth muscle, and they are involuntarily controlled, and those are called the, that is called the internal anal sphincter. There is also skeletal muscle externally, and it is voluntarily controlled, and that is referred to as the external anal sphincter. The opening of the anal canal into the universe is called the anus. There are ridges within the anal canal, and those are called anal columns. And they contain veins that are referred to as hemorrhoidal veins, and this is where a person does get hemorrhoids. So here's a zoomed in view of the large intestine and the small intestine. So here we have the ilium entering into the cecum at the ileocecal valve. Okay, there's our appendix. The cecum, the ascending colon, the right colic flexure, the transverse colon, the left colic flexure, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, and the rectum. Okay, now I want you to notice these blood vessels back here. Okay, so these blood vessels are the superior mesenteric arteries and the inferior mesenteric arteries. Let's remember that the superior mesenteric artery fed the small intestine and the right half of the large intestine. So if we flip this around then, this must be the superior mesenteric artery and its branches. Okay, and let's remember that the inferior mesenteric artery fed the left half of the large intestine. <clears throat> so therefore, this must be the inferior mesenteric artery and its branches. And I also want to point out on here um, some connective tissue that actually holds the intestines in place. Okay, so the tissue that holds the intestines against the um, posterior uh, side of the abdominal wall is called mesentery. So there's mesentery that holds the small intestine against the posterior abdominal wall, and there's mesentery that holds the large intestine against the posterior abdominal wall. Some people refer to the mesentery that's holding the large intestine against the posterior abdominal wall uh, as mesocolon. 
Okay, um, but they're both um, portions of mesentery. So this is a transverse section of the abdomen. Okay, it's at the level of T12. Okay, so just to get you oriented, we've got the muscles of the back here. We've got the spinous process of T12. We've got the vertebral body of T12 forming the vertebral column in which lies the spinal cord. And then moving anteriorly, so we are moving posterior to anterior. Uh, we've got the abdominal aorta and the inferior vena cava, spleen and liver. Remember, the kidneys are located retroperitoneally or posterior to the peritoneal cavity. So these are the kidneys. Um, and then here we have the splenic artery, which we've talked about before. And this would be the common hepatic artery going off towards the liver, okay? Now remember, we're just in a transverse section, so the liver doesn't look like it looks if you're taking a um, frontal view, okay? So um, this is the stomach. This is a transverse section of the stomach, okay? And um, the, uh, so these are all organs of the peritoneal cavity or the abdominal cavity. This would be your rectus abdominis out here anteriorly. Now there are um, serous membranes that cover the organs and that line the abdominal cavity. So just like when we talked about the heart and just like when we talked about the lungs, the serous membrane that covers the organs themselves, that lies right on top of the organs themselves, is called visceral peritoneum, visceral meaning organs. And the uh, serous membrane that lines the entire peritoneal cavity is called parietal peritoneum. There is some connective tissue that connects the lesser curvature of the stomach to the liver, and that's this. And it's like a double fold of the um, uh, visceral peritoneum, um, and it comes out and attaches to the inferior aspect of the liver, and that is called the lesser omentum. Um, we just left off talking about the lesser omentum. It has been removed in this image. The lesser omentum connects the lesser curvature of the stomach to the inferior aspect of the liver. It has been removed in this image so that we can see the vessels that are behind it. Okay, now here's another view of mesentery. Mesentery attaching the small intestine to the posterior wall of the abdominal cavity. So once again, lesser omentum connects the lesser curvature of the stomach to the inferior aspect of the liver. This fatty apron here is referred to as greater omentum. And the greater omentum drapes from the uh, inferior portion of the stomach and the transverse colon downward and covers up the small intestine. So in order to be able to see the small intestine, you actually do have to pull back the greater omentum as they have done in this image. So this is the inferior aspect of the liver. The liver normally sits um, uh, more forward, and they've pulled it up so we can see the inferior aspect. This is the right lobe of the liver. This is the left lobe of the liver, and this is the gallbladder. There is a duct leaving the gallbladder called the cystic duct. There's a duct leaving the left lobe of the liver called the left hepatic duct. There is a duct leaving the right lobe of the liver called the right hepatic duct. Those two ducts converge to form the common hepatic duct. The common hepatic duct joins with the cystic duct to form the common bile duct. And we've seen the common bile duct before. Uh, the common bile duct will um, converge with the major pancreatic duct, which is leaving the pancreas. Um, and emptying into the duodenum. 
So we're going to take a closer look at the liver. And uh, real livers don't have this rod sticking out of them, but this was sitting on a um, base, so um, I removed it from its base. So pretend this isn't here. This is the right lobe of the liver. This is the left lobe of the liver. And then there's two other lobes of the liver. One is called the quadrate lobe, and it's roughly shaped like a quadrangle in math, okay? And it is um, uh, right next to the gallbladder, okay? And the other lobe of the liver is called the caudate lobe in an animal the caudal is posterior, so this is in the posterior aspect of the liver, okay? So um, the, like this, okay? The uh, right lobe of the liver has inferior to it the gallbladder, okay? And uh, we also see some blood vessels here um, this is a vessel that we've talked about before. This is the hepatic portal vein, bringing all of the venous blood from the GI tract into the liver. So the liver can grab what it needs out of that blood supply from the GI tract. This is the, um, sometimes this is referred to as the um, common hepatic artery and other texts will refer to this as the hepatic proper artery. So the, um, generally the artery that goes into the liver is called the hepatic proper artery. Notice that the hepatic portal vein branches into smaller and smaller portal venules and that the common hepatic artery branches into smaller and smaller and smaller hepatic arteries. The, um, uh, there's various duct work right here that you need to be able to identify as well. Um, so out of the gallbladder comes the cystic duct. And out of the right lobe of the liver comes the right hepatic duct. Out of the left lobe of the liver comes the left hepatic duct. They join to form the common hepatic duct. The common hepatic duct joins with the cystic duct. And as this duct would continue outward, it would be called the common bile duct. So recall that this is the first portion of the small intestine called the duodenum. To refresh your memory, this is the pancreas, main or major pancreatic duct, joining with the common bile duct, emptying into the duodenum by way of the major duodenal papilla, which is governed by the sphincter of Odi. And remember that enlargement where the main pancreatic duct joins with the common bile duct is called the ampulla of Vader or the hepatic pancreatic ampulla. So here we are in the small intestine and all of the alimentary canal is lined with mucous membrane, okay? So we're gonna zero in on the mucous membrane that lines the uh, intestines. But first I want you to notice these structures here, these ridges. Okay, these can be seen grossly um, and they are called circular folds or plicae circularis. So we're actually going to take a closer look at what we would find on these circular folds in the next couple of models. So this model is a cross-sectional model of the walls of the alimentary canal, starting with the esophagus, then the stomach, then the small intestine, then the large intestine. So I'm just gonna demonstrate to you the layers of the mucosa 
of the alimentary canal. So remember, the alimentary canal is lined with a mucous membrane, so we're going to talk about the layers of that mucous membrane. Okay, so um, the most internal layer from the lumen of the organ out to this thin muscular layer here is called the mucosa. So mucosa goes from the lumen to this thin muscular layer, which is called the muscularis mucosa. And then if we go external to that, we are in the submucosa, which is a layer of connective tissue, which contains blood vessels and lymphatic vessels, and as you can see, also contains some glands. Okay, and then we move external to that, and we see, um, in this case, two layers of smooth muscle. Okay, and this layer is referred to as the muscularis layer. Sometimes people will just say muscularis, and other people will call this muscularis externa. Now, recall that the esophagus will pass through the esophageal hiatus into the stomach. Okay, so this is the esophagus, this is the stomach. And um, if we are in the most external layer of the esophagus, this is a layer of connective tissue, we refer to this as the adventitia. So we're above the diaphragm here, this is referred to as the adventitia. We are not in the abdominal cavity at this point. Once the esophagus passes into the stomach, this most external layer here is called serosa, or we could also call this the uh, visceral peritoneum. Okay, so this would be the serosa of the stomach, this would be the serosa of the small intestine, this would be the serosa of the large intestine. So just to recap, we have the mucosa, 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 the muscularis mucosa, the sub mucosa, the muscularis externa, and if we're in the abdominal cavity, we would call this the serosa or the visceral peritoneum, and if we were on the esophagus, we would call this the adventitia. So this is a magnification of the last model that we looked at. So this is a model of the small intestine, and this is the lumen of the small intestine where the food would be. And um, so from here, um, this is uh, epithelial tissue here that lines the small intestine, simple columnar epithelial tissue. From here to here, this is the um, muscularis mucosa. So that layer there would be called the mucosa. So mucosa goes from the epithelial tissue to the thin muscular layer. External to that, we would find the submucosa. The submucosa contains blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, um, and lymphatic tissue. And then the um, uh, external to the submucosa, we have the muscularis externa. And then external to that, we would have the serosa or the visceral peritoneum. <clears throat> so let's take a closer look at some of these structures. Um, so I mentioned the lymphatic vessels a second ago. So there are a lot of lymphatics here in the intestines, uh, which makes sense because the lymphatic system is part of our immune system and we have the potential to have a lot of pathogens within our intestine. So um, here we see, of course, uh, veins, arteries, and then these green vessels are called lymphatic collecting vessels. Um, this part of the mucosa of the small intestine, um, these are called villi, okay? So uh, they increase the surface area for absorption in the intestines. And within the intestinal villi, we also see um, capillaries, and we see this important vessel right here for the lymphatic system. So this is a lymphatic capillary, and it has a special name. It's called a lacteal. 
and its purpose is to absorb dietary lipids. So um, there is a specialized lymphatic uh, capillary within the villi of the mucosa of the small intestine, and that is called a lacteal. We also see this kind of blob of stuff here. That is a lymphoid follicle, and a lymphoid follicle contains many lymphocytes, and lymphocytes are also part of our immune system. Um, if we are in the small intestine, more specifically, if we are in the jejunum, because that's where we're most likely to find um, these collections of um, lymphoid follicles, uh, we would call we would have a special name for those lymphoid follicles. They're called Peyer's patches. Okay, found in mostly in the jejunum of the small intestine. Now, within the mucosa of the small intestine, I mentioned those villi. Now look here, there's a depression uh, within the mucosa here, okay? And so that is um, uh, a gland. Um, sometimes it's called the um, intestinal gland or, or the intestinal crypt or the crypt of Lieberkuhn. So it has various different names. And it only goes down to within the mucosa of the small intestine. If we look, if we take another look, uh, we see a gland that goes into the submucosa. So we go all the way down through the mucosa into the submucosa, okay? And this is called the um, uh, Bruner's gland or the duodenal gland, and it contains many mucus-producing cells. Mucus is an important um, factor associated with the small intestine. This concludes the demonstration of the digestive system, where we, di where we demonstrated the organs of the alimentary canal to include the oral cavity, the pharynx and all of its sections, the esophagus, the stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and we also studied the accessory organs of the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas.